back, folks, to the WP Tonic Roundtable Show. This is episode 582, but actually, listeners and viewers, it feels much longer than that, actually. Uh, um, we've got a great panel. I rustled up. It's a small panel, but a powerful panel. And we've got some fantastic stories. I'm going to let the panel quickly introduce themselves. First of all, Chris. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Chris from Lifter LMS, and we help course creators create, launch, and scale high-value online training programs. also have a podcast for WordPress professionals making LMS websites called LMS Cast. And I've got my friend Sally. Sally, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Sally Getch, the WP Fangirl, organizer of the East Bay WordPress Meetup in <clears throat> and, uh, Oakland, California, except mostly on Zoom. All right, that's great. And I've got, I don't know what he is, mentor, friend, <laughs> main, maniac. I've got Spencer, Uncle Spencer on the show. We'd like to introduce I, yourself, Spencer. This week, I would prefer to go with Man from La Mancha. Mm-hmm. Um, Spencer Foreman from WPLaunchify.com. By the way, Sally, turn up your, your gain just slightly. Yeah, you need to I don't your... have hardware controls for the sound of my mic, oh, you don't? and I don't know where to control it in StreamYard. Yeah, don't leave it alone. We're going to flap around. Uh, um, so, <laughs> all right. All right. Um, before we go into the main stories of the week, uh, I want to talk about my major sponsor, and that's Castus. Castus. Um, what is Castus? Um, well, if you're looking to do a podcast, and I suggest in 2021 that you really should look at be, becoming a podcaster. It's uh, a great way of promoting yourself and your business. Um, they provide a platform for publishing your audio files um, to all the places that you need to be broadcasting your podcast to, like um, iTunes, Spotify, and they provide a lot more than that. They're really WordPress-friendly. Um, they've got Matt Medeus on their team. Um, they're just great people. And they decided that they wanted to be, become part of the WP Tonic tribe and family, and their support is much appreciated. So I suggest that you go over to costus.com and have a look at what they've got to offer and buy one of their plans. And if you do do that, please tell them that you heard about them on the WP Tonic Show. So let's go into our first story. First look at the initial designs for WordPress block pattern directory. What did you think of this one, Chris? I'm in love with it. I think this is a game changer for WordPress. Um, So if we think about it, like I'm old enough in WordPress to remember using a WYSIWYG editor as a non-developer to try to put together a nice looking site. Then came page builders. At first you had to build in the back end of like these columns inside the WordPress editor. And then came the front end page builders like Beaver Builder, Elementor and so on. And what these tool, these page builders did is on the front end, they gave you regular users like people like me and maybe a lot of you listening or watching out there these tools to build great looking sites. But with that power, they also gave people to build really terrible looking sites because they don't have a, a professional design background and all these things like color and spacing. So I think we overshot the mark a little bit. And then what happened is the page builders and theme creators started creating templates like entire websites that you could just suck in that had better coherent design principles but block patterns is kind of the middle way between you got a powerful tool but you're not really a professional designer to a site that's already done it's moving into more of like an atomic design kind of thing where you have these components that you can use so i think this is the pattern library i think is super smart for wordpress and we'll know we're successful with it when regular users start lo- creating better looking sites that look good, that have good user experience without necessarily having a strong design background. That's like the magic trick that WordPress needs to play right now. 
is they need to empower regular users to create great looking sites that when people land on it, they know how to navigate and use the website. This is not to diminish the role of the designer and the professional in the ecosystem, but from a tooling standpoint, I'm super excited for patterns and we had to get through a lot of stages and phases until here, but I'm really excited to see where it's going to go. That's great. What do you reckon, Sally? Uh, I reckon that no matter what tools you give people, some of them just have no taste. Uh, <laughs> and that's why, that you know, it's not simply that they don't have the, the skills or the understanding of how design works. All it, does little, uh, it, does, it does sound a little, it does, it does sound, it does sound a little bit snobby to say that, but it's true though, isn't it, Sally? Uh, well, uh, yes. And sometimes people do want things on their website that are you know, maybe they're pretty, but they're very bad for usability. And and that kind of tension is something that, that a lot of people, even where they can, you know, can make something good looking, um, don't understand. However, uh, I do really like the block pattern uh, directory as they're uh, proposing it. One of the things I like best about it is that it's not just like smushed into a teeny space inside the editor. <laughs> Uh, uh, but that you can actually see the patterns well enough to get some uh, some sense of them. And if you can copy and paste them, that's good. And if, if it's easy for people to contribute them, that's even better. Um, uh, and I don't know. I mean, you know, given all of the uh, kerfuffle we've had around, uh, you know, the theme <laughs> approval team and the plugin approval team, I'm not sure if they're like a block pattern uh, approval team. Uh, and, and if so, what is it that they're that they're mm. watching out for? I, I, was, I was thinking when I was when I said you know about being a bit snotty, but it's a bit like copywriting. I've had people, clients, say to me, "Oh, I've got an MA in English, you know, and I'm a dyslexic, so I definitely ain't got an MA in in." Uh, um, but their copywriting for a website is appalling, you know. Uh, um, so. What do you reckon, Spencer? Well, one of the things I want to point out is that I, I agree with everything that Chris is saying, that in theory, it sounds like super exciting if you can bring in block patterns. But in practice, my, <laughs> I was having this discussion just this morning indirectly of there are those who are, artistic, are artistically gifted. I happen to know a few people who literally, from the moment their hands could hold a pencil, are like, sketching and doing artistic things. In digital artists, we see the same thing. That does not apply to those that are necessarily technical minded or those who are business minded. So my greater concern is we were looking this morning at like wordpress.com, wordpress.org. And um, if I can do this without breaking it, I was going to solo this in. This is for example, like wordpress.com. Um, if you go there and look at the design of that site, I would argue that you would feel a bit like you've gone into a time machine and somebody went into a paint store and threw a bunch of random paints. Now, that's not so much a criticism of the people working for WordPress.com. It's a statement that the people who are going to make this directory are not either interested or capable of making really high level design decisions about this pattern is really awesome, worthy of being here or not. And if they do take on that decision, then are we kind of back in the Mick Epstein problem of a couple of weeks ago of like, why is that block pattern good and my block pattern isn't? You've ruined my life. So it's, it's a slippery slope here. Um, the independent page builders have one advantage over WordPress is that like if the team at Elementor makes a decision, they make it from a corporate level, investor level, like this is good for our pocketbook, everybody else be damned. Whereas in the world of automatic, it's, it's a decision, is this good for automatic or is it really good for the community? And we see that the things in the community don't really move at a pace that are, I don't know how to say this, but like logical or based upon factual data or based upon aesthetic agreement that this is the way things should be done. So. Right, yeah. You know, I think we move on to the next one, shall we? All right. <clears throat> a Biden broad, broadband plan will be heated by big ISPs. Welcome to the internet users. And you, you brought this to my attention, Spencer. Why, why did you like this story? Okay, so besides Otto, 
I think the number one person that's on my list of people who have done the most who interfere with everyone else's free use of like a, a, an open source public thing would be Ajit Pai, who was the guy who was in charge, appointed by, I believe, I don't think he was appointed by Trump. I think he was appointed by previous Republican administration. He was the guy at the FCC who decided that, you know, all of the open internet and all the other things would be good for promoting everybody having access to the internet would be bad for his pals in big business. And until he was literally forcibly pulled from his chair after Biden became the, uh, you know, the president, um, he was like full throttle going down the path of we're all going to be living in the dial up era if he had his way about it. Now, thankfully, thankfully, and, and what's ironic, I think Chris got so offended he had to leave. Thankfully, I think he decided to leave this time. <laughs> there has been a decision made. I know Chris is as liberal as any of us, but thankfully there's been a decision made kind of, kind of like old school, uh, you know, politics. We're going to spend as much money as it takes on public service, public works, public infrastructure things, including internet access, which means that the cities, the states, the towns will own the infrastructure, which means that the, the Comcasts and the, you know, the AT&Ts and the other local, you know, RCM <laughs> will not choke people and will not have the ability to get the blessing of somebody like an Ajit Pai if they come into power again to choke people off from the internet. Because let's be honest, if you're in a city or a town or you're a kid and you don't have access to the internet or it's limited, you are not a participant at the same level as everybody else in our society right now. So. I think the other exciting thing, I, I know there's a couple of people that I know that just bought it, is the Tesla um, broadband satellite system. Uh, uh, um, when that's fully functioning, I think also that would be a, a game changer to some extent. Like the, uh, you... the, one, the one that's coming in from uh, Starlink. From yeah, Starlink, Starlink. Yeah, the Starlink. Yeah. Which is another way to democratize it. But this is interesting because Starlink is privately owned but still democratizing and a disruptor. This is going one step further by returning ownership of the infrastructure by mandate and being subsidized by the government to the municipalities, which is just like everything yeah. else. There's no yeah. private company that owns the, the pipe that brings the water to your house. They can be in the business of, of working with it but they can't own it and then stop you in some other way. Well, you reckon I don't know. Sally? Somebody's got to build it. And that's usually the, uh... that's the infrastructure investment. This is like, you know, I forgot, I forgot who initiated it, but post world war two, I'm pretty sure it was still under, I, I, I want to think it was under Roosevelt still, but, but like the building of the Hoover dam, that was actually in 1935. So it was before world war two, it was post, Depression the, era. The Works Progress Act. It was smack in the middle of the Depression, which right, and so the late twenties, early thirties, or two, and, um, and millions of people working to build infrastructure that give everybody access to the stuff we all need to start selling and doing more and being more logical. And, and, How hard is that? Uh, apparently, know? it's hard because it, it took such a dire situation to make it happen. <clears throat> Um, you know, I, I, I'm kind of in favor of anything that's going to make Comcast unhappy because Comcast makes me unhappy often enough. Uh, it, it, and there's no, there's really no alternative uh, where I am because uh, the other possibility is is AT and T's DSL. I mean, AT and T couldn't get me an adequate landline. Uh, I, I'm not going to trust my uh, my internet to them. Um, so I'm definitely interested in, you know, more competition and the possibility of municipal ISPs. I, I was interested to read in this article that there are, you know, 19 states that restrict the growth of municipal broadband by law. And, yeah. and, and guess, yeah. which, guess which political party is in charge of it? The same one that brought you waiting in line and not getting water to go vote. And the reason is because they're funded essentially by the private ISPs. I mean, it's just, it's not like a secret anymore. And I'm not being no. political. Well, you are, but um, well, I'm being political in the sense of calling it what it is. Like, yeah. I mean, yes. Well, you, you, mean, you'd never, you'd never be known for that, will you? Um, over to, over to Chris. Right. I'm not always a fan of the government 
stepping in, but in this case for uh, infrastructure and considering the internet as part of our critical infrastructure, not just our bridges and highways and whatnot, I think it's a smart idea. And we've all had a terrible experience with like Sally with Comcast, T Time Warner, whatever the big monopoly is by you that if you ever had to work with one of these companies, it's very bad. And uh, just having that pressure of competition from the government, I think would, would be very helpful. And, and it's just insane when you think about it, how much innovation, speed, creativity, customer centric focus is happening on the layer on top of the underlying infrastructure, like in, you know, web applications and software and all these things. When you look at the actual backbone and the skeleton of the whole thing, it's like this stodgy old thing that needs disruption. So I think that's super helpful. I think that um, the government could have moved a long time ago on this. So I'm a big fan of guaranteed jobs, not just in the military, but having more innovation. And if we're going to stimulate the economy using things like investing in the in internet infrastructure is a smart idea. Um, and if we can create jobs with that, I we should have been doing that a year ago, as soon as the pandemic hit. And there could have been a lot, there's also a lot of, you know, socially distanced online or with young, healthy, um, populations, kind of like the, uh, the Peace Corps for fighting, uh, the pandemic, the, all this government jobs could have been happening a long time ago. So I'm excited to see it finally happening in some true lasting stimulation. That's going to be good for everybody. Right, yo. Um, what should I do? I seem to be missing the story. Um, uh, no, I'm not. Right. Uh, I seem to be missing a. I seem to be missing the story. Where come in my story? Ten up, ten up relaunches. Founders of Ubone, Unsplash. Yeah, let's go for that one then. Ten up relaunches. What do you think of this one, Sally? All right, so this caught my eye because it is an interesting problem trying to get, uh, you know, print print CSS is already kind of a complicated and thorny uh, 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 subject. It's it's not easy to get uh, good printing on web pages, um, but this is something where they actually uh, custom created a plugin to transfer your WordPress site or your blog posts or whatever and format them uh, and integrate it directly with InDesign, which is the most common of the uh, book design uh, tools that's used these days. Uh, and I just thought, that is amazingly cool. Uh, I don't like see a direct use for it for me for a client but it also makes me think you know i do have clients that do a lot of print stuff if they didn't have to like separately generate all their print stuff and their web stuff that could be a, a really good potential savings and uh, i have helped people to write books by first blogging and then organizing the blog posts and kind of you know uh, re revising it and and updating it uh so I think uh, I think this is really interesting and worth knowing again about. Uh, and Tenup has produced some great plugins. There wasn't I think another one they just announced about uh, mass converting your uh, your site to blocks from the classic editor. Um, there's one called Distributor I think that's meant for publishing from uh, a you know uh, the the main site and a multi-site to sub-sites, but can also be used to pub to transfer from, you know, uh, staging to live or uh, other kinds of things if you need to, to move stuff around. So I, I think this is a, a thing people should know about uh, in case it's something that is useful to them or their clients. What do you reckon, Chris? I find this interesting. I'm not super deep on the technology, but you know, in our space, we deal with people doing print certificates and, uh, you know, in learning context, oftentimes, depending upon the population, especially they may want to take 
a piece of content for review offline and stuff like that. So I'm just going to have to dig in deeper and, and learn more myself. It looks I can see this would be good for, uh, for educators that you have like the optional uh, course guide follow up that, that you could get, um, uh, you know, printed or as a, 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 as a PDF workbook sort of a thing. Yeah. Workbooks hugely popular. If you, if you would, Sally, describe it to me, like what is the job to be done here? Like, what does this do? What is sure? Yeah. So basically, it says, uh, you know, design individual print publications by organizing WordPress posts into uh, print issues. I presume they don't have to just be posts. Um, with if we're going to if we're going to just PDF, is that good or is this really intended for stuff that's going to become physical form? I think both, because yeah. when you're doing book design, basically that the content gets imported into something like InDesign so that it can be laid out mm. appropriately with all the typography and where the illustrations are and the heading levels and the flow and, and the things that um, like, you know, Microsoft Word is not good at uh, in terms of making it really readable when printed. But you could take that uh, design and produce, you know, a PDF, or you could produce a print book. Um, you could even, uh, I know uh, InDesign can output to things like EPUB for eBooks, although uh, the way that most eBooks work is, you know, you don't have that level of design control because the, uh, the reader uh, uh, can make changes and it will, you know, mm -hmm reflow based on on <clears throat> font size and other really important things for those of us who are old and read a lot um <sighs> well i think i think it, anything that can help it on that side because it's a, a neglected area really what do you reckon spencer i think it's really interesting actually <clears throat> the the space is interesting i can give you a use case that chris might feel would be applicable um there are situations where somebody has a lot of course content and it's available only online through, let's say, Lyft or LMS. And they want to offer it as an alternative because either they're having a live event or because they want to take advantage of... <clears throat> There's this marketing tool. I don't know if you guys remember it. It was around a long time ago. It was called the US Mail. And people used to send all kinds of crap in it. But now nobody does. So, like, theoretically, it works really well as a marketer if you send people on your email list a postcard or maybe, like, a really cool folded-up print of whatever. So there's a reason that sometimes it might be useful to take content that's otherwise online and use it for marketing or for educating or for further distribution. However, I want to clarify. I, I'm trying to put into the, um, the chat. I put in the private. There's a difference here. This one specifically requires you to go to the InDesign format of XML. So you need for this one to be using InDesign in order to get it to a PDF. But there are other plugins free and paid, like WordPress posts to PDF, that you can accomplish a similar result where you just go right to PDF. So for example, and from a consumption standpoint, it might be more deliverable, you could, let's say, here's a sample of our course available in ready to go format in a PDF versus logging into the site. Both of them have their uses. But I want to point out one final thing, which is I was talking to somebody who's a venture capitalist and uh, things have changed in that world. But, you know, in the old days, you used to have a slide deck or pitch deck or whatever, and they would show it on a screen or, or they would print it at Kinko's, you know. And now if you were pitching a VC and you don't give them an iPad to look at the thing digitally, I mean, they look at you like you're from another planet. So there are less and less reasons that people print stuff today because of all of the, the, the time, the waste, the eco-friendliness of using digital stuff. So it's clever, but I wonder if it's not too much like, uh, let's learn how to carve wood into wagon wheels and stuff. All right, Tio, I think it's time for us to go for our break. We'll be back. We've got some more stories. We've got the panel's um, recommendations of the week. We'll be back in a few moments, folks. <laughs> We're coming back. Before we go into our other stories, I want to mention another new sponsor. That's Conversio. Conversio. What is Conversio? It's a specialized WordPress hosting provider. 
really aimed at the agency um, freelancer, a really slick interface, really performance orientated. And if you're really into um, the tech, tech side of hosting, you will love their offering. Um, really powerful hosting for learning management systems, for e-commerce, for anybody that's got multiple websites or or is supporting multiple websites, you're going to love this WordPress hosting provider. I suggest you go over there, have a look what they've got offer, and give them a try. I, I was impressed when they showed me the technology that they're using on their platform. And we like to thank them for supporting the show. It's much appreciated. So on to the next story. Um, this is an interesting one in ways. Uh, Uniborn, I think, how do you pronounce it? Founders of bankrupt startup Un Uniborn. Is it Uniborn? Uniborn. I like you. Oh, you say it better. <laughs> in the well, clearly, Uniborn. Some, clearly something bombed. Yeah, indicated and fraud case. The actual two founders are on the FBI wanted list. They have seconded. They have disappeared. So if you um, come across these two Charlies, um, you probably uh, should give the FBI a, a call. What do you reckon about this one, Spencer? This reminds me a lot of the um, internet poker world. Back in the original days when internet poker was created, the founders, there was maybe half a dozen of them, seemed to follow all the laws and the regulations and talk to the right guy, silver bite error, and it was supposed to be okay. But then somebody realized there's either a lot of money to be made or a career to be made in prosecution, and they not only told them to shut it down, but they went to prosecute all of them and put them away for the rest of their lives, at the same time allowing some new people to come in and do exactly the same thing, but now, of course, under the umbrella and protection of the federal government and so forth. So there's this company, then there was the other one that was a high profile, and another one. Yeah, I forgot her name. She, she Fer Theranos to... is the company Theranos. that, that Theranos. Jonathan is, is thinking of. Yes, I, I'm just looking at all the wonderful headlines talking about um, <clears throat> uh, the poop testing startup, uh, I mean, which is apparently what uh, Ubiome did. The, the problem that these people face is that we are all familiar, if you've dealt with Silicon Valley whatsoever, that there's a lot of hype and promises that never get lived up to, right? The question becomes, what areas do you not want to go into to hype stuff? And I would say it's safe to say, stay away from gambling, in, you know, stay away from human health, because those seem yeah. to be rife with, after things go wrong, they're going to come after you. Whereas you can certainly hype any kind of website bullshit this or bullshit that or, you know, a gadget this or that. And nobody seems to care. Remember that website called Color that was it took like five billion dollars of. Yeah, you don't remember it. It existed for like five seconds. But the guy blew through like five billion dollars of cash. And then there's the WeWork people. Right. The WeWork guy is still on the lam. They never put him in prison. Uh, yeah, and WeWork is yet is he like having an IPO, and I'm like, seriously? Right. But like for some reason, they need to indict this lady and Zach. Well, yeah, but, because yeah, but... there are laws regulating medicine yeah. and medical uh, claims I, and things I see like where, that. Before I put it over to Chris, I can see where you're coming from, Spencer. But I think it's like education. I think, and I think they're right. I think investors are right to view it, um, healthcare in America is ripe for disruption. I, I mean, it's it's a total sitting target. Um, and so is education in America, higher education. It's it's like a dodo. It's just waiting to be club, clubbed. Uh, um, it's just w totally waiting for disruption. So um, those two enormous industries are just sitting there and that's why but what i read these two founders you know um they were actively involved in criminality to some extent um i think it even went 
above Theranos, you know, to, in you know, in its criminality to some extent. I, I, all, all I'm saying is that if you did a side by side comparison, and sorry, I don't want to interrupt on Chris, but if you did a side by side comparison of the wrongdoings of various founders who have taken money and flushed it down the toilet, even we work. If you look at all the chicanery of their billing practices and like he he and his wife created their own internal companies to then charge back against the investors for the money that was invested in the thing. Like, why is it that him and his wife are not indicted? And it comes down to a higher complaint from another party who is financially incentivized to get these people out of the way. In this case, I think it's clear that somebody in the insurance or the healthcare industry is like, yeah. get these guys out of the way, and some prosecutor's making a name. Whereas nobody seems to care above the uh, WeWork guys because they ripped off that Asian investment. Uh, well, maybe, maybe they just had really, maybe they just had really good lawyers, and they were in that in that trial, trial white gray area that you know you hire good lawyers for. You know, uh, what do you reckon, Chris? I think it's really sad because I think the microbiome and gut health in general, yeah. there's a lot of room for innovation yeah. and good yeah. science here. And much like people uh, really want to know like about they about themselves, like whether it's a personality thing or what are they genetically predisposed to or who are they compatible with? People really want to know. Uh, they want insight into their, their own self. And, and with the discovery of the microbiome and how it impacts health, I think this startup had a lot of potential coming at it from a, as a bootstrapper myself with no funding, no backers, nothing. I just imagine like, cause these, these founders raised $350,000 initially on a crowdfunding campaign and they joined Y Combinator and a lot of investment capital came in that pressure to succeed with other people's money. I imagine that weight is just like super heavy. And when you have all that extra capital sloshing around, it's an experience I don't I don't know a lot about because I chose a different path. But um, I could see why in many cases people get, they kind of lose their way. And, and which is really unfortunate in this case because of the potential of the microbiome and technology in this sector for, you know, public health. Well, I do yeah. think that the more people want something, the easier it is to defraud them. I mean, there's been a, a lot of snake oil stuff. Uh, you know, that's like from the dawn of time or certainly pretty much from the dawn of America. People selling, you know, elixirs and and whatnot, claiming all and, and sundry kinds of, of things. And, uh, you know, people buy them because they want the cure for whatever and... I mean, it, it doesn't seem, based on the emails I get about, uh, you know, health and, and <clears throat> oriented uh, startups, like situations like these are deterring anybody from exploring it. But it's also the kind of thing that you really, it seems like it's tough to bootstrap. I mean, this is why most of this kind of research is done in universities yeah. and and so on uh or by you know drug companies or or whoever because you've got to have you have to test things you have to have a large sample population you have to have you know and then right. you have to if it's anything you're going to make something remotely like a medical claim about you have to go through this massively expensive process of getting it approved by the fda yeah but there's um also you know because of the pandemic you know, a lot of people have become more interested, especially investors, in telemedicine, haven't they, Chris? About seeing your doctor on on Zoom or remotely. Yeah, I mean, there's a stock you know. called Teladoc that's just up and to the right. I mean, we're watching all this acceleration of um, industries that needed to accelerate in terms of digital transformation, healthcare being one. I think it's a beautiful thing to just see see a lot of this waiting room friction, yeah. scheduling friction. Just uh, there's just so much room for innovation in the healthcare experience in America and worldwide. Uh, well, yes, I think it is good that the uh, that that the healthcare system has been shaken up by the think, uh, pandemic. Yeah, I think another thing that should be a warning sign is, is, is 
is the founder and CEO having a sexual relationship with the chief financial officer of the company? I don't think that's all. <laughs> I think that that's mixing positions a bit too much. Um, and the love feels. Um, well, yes, I mean, unless to, you were a couple to begin with, and um, this was one of those like husband wife team projects, but still, you might think better to have somebody else in a certain position to be sure that you aren't. Uh, you know, being unduly uh, influenced or making bad decisions. And just to wrap it up, my observation, you know, Fam Famos, you know, I um, the founder, I forgot her name, though, um, I can see her, but I think in some ways she was her worst enemy because the, um, and I agree with Chris, the sad thing is she had backed off a bit um, and said, oh, yeah, we had a go at this, but we, we're we not going to be able to build this machine. We had a good go at it. But we're just going to concentrate on this one particular disease and we're just going to improve it a bit initially. And then we see, I think she I think she could have had a really good business and kept most of those uh, yes, bankers. But, you know, Silicon Valley doesn't want to invest in a good, solid business idea that, that's going to, you know... Uh, continue to be profitable over time. They all want the unicorn that will do everything. And like, of course, this area is full of scam artists. That's what they're looking for. I mean, it's like the difference between the the school scandal with, let's say, Lori Laughlin and Massimo, her husband, the way they handle themselves, not being contrite, versus William Macy and his wife that were really contrite at the beginning. The you know, the, the Macy's took their licks, but she spent like, I don't know what, it was like a week or something in jail, made her public apologies, put her head down, said it was a huge mistake, so so, so sorry, so sorry. And the prosecutors were satisfied because that's what they needed, right? They needed them to kiss their boot. Whereas Lori Laughlin and her husband rode that baby out and then had the unfortunate but so predictable bad luck that the pandemic hit, and everybody lost any public sympathy for them whatsoever. And the prosecutors took them to town. And then they ended up doing, I forgot what it was. It was like three months, six months of like virtual, you know, not hard labor, but like real time during the pandemic. And when they got out, nobody gave a shit. And their own daughter that they spent all the money on was on social media. Like, I'm not going to college. I'm going to be a, you know, a social media maven and stuff. So the point is, Elias, I'm going to be an influencer. Don't be like, don't be like Wesley Snipes. Don't be like. Oh, the hey, we If you get in trouble for defrauding the public or the government, suck it up, make an apology, get on with it, because they're not going to let you off until somebody gets the win. I mean, it's just. And yeah. Elizabeth Holmes is the Theranos founder. I mean. Yeah. She's done. I mean, no, oh, she's bait. She's, yeah. she's never going back. All right, on to the last story. Um, Unsplash has been required from Getty Images. Oh, that's regrettable. The most favorite, the most favorite company on the internet, Getty Images. What do you reckon about this one, Sally? I was a little alarmed to see it. I mean, you know, they, they assure us uh, that. Uh, you know, the unsplash <laughs> photos will remain free and et cetera, and et cetera, yeah, and et cetera. Sure. But sure. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm like, yeah, for how long? Uh, I mean, Get Getty Images is the most savage about prosecuting <laughs> infringement. <laughs> the worst is using one of, their, like, one of their images. And they charge a lot of money for their images. They, they make cable companies look like sweethearts. <laughs> oh, I mean, like, no, there, there is a, there's nobody that compares to Getty Images other than a phishing operation, like with PH, for harassing innocent people <laughs> and threatening them with bodily harm. I mean, as an attorney, I can say their practices are on par with, like, the collection agency. And they do it in a way that is essentially extortionistic because they know they're going after the victim who is the company or the person who paid a web designer and got these images on their site, and now they get this threatening, we're going to take away your home and your children. Um, the only good news about this is that this will clarify whether to go to pexels.com versus Unsplash, because quite frankly, the quality images of Pexels, which remain free, are just as good, and there's about 100 other sites like it. So Getty doing this 
it's just going to be the end of people bothering with Unsplash, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I was thinking that they paid quite a well, chunk. I also, they? wasn't there kind of an issue about the Unsplash plugin for WordPress a few months ago, and and something to do with with licenses or something? I, I was like, yeah, I'm wondering. <laughs> suddenly, was was this related in any way? Oh well, we never know, will we? What do you reckon, Chris? It's um, the death of. Uh, so I use a. Uh... I use a graphic design resource just for quick design turnaround stuff called Design Pickle. And in the back, in my lower level plan, there's a um, you can select some images from Unsplash. But if you want Getty images, you have to get on their bigger plan. So I imagine that, you know, as Unsplash absorbs into this more money hungry company, like because, yeah, God forbid, the Getty just doesn't have enough money. Yeah, I, I mean, as, as well, you can you never have enough money, can you? There's God. pixels, there's Pixabay. I, I agree. There's something else will just fill the void. I just, it's sad to me because I loved Unsplash's. Um, I don't know quite how to describe it, but their filter of content, there was a quality level there that I always appreciated. So if I was going mm -hmm. to Unsplash and I want a picture of a mountain or a picture of a trail through the woods or whatever. The, the quality, I didn't have to weed through a bunch of crap to find something good. So uh, that's what I'll miss. But I understand like all things evolve and businesses and models have a life cycle. So I guess this is the end of a long road, but it's a sad one. I've, I've used Unsplash a lot over the years. All right, let's, um, let's go for our recommendations. I didn't put one, but I'm going to recommend my new sponsor, Sodit, because I've been using... Um, their interface for my own podcast, and that's Cast Castos. Um, and uh, Castos, I bet start pronouncing this correctly. Uh, um, yes, but, Castos, presumably from a uh, uh, podcast, uh, but also meaning pure. Oh, does it? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, um, pure. I like that. It's got, yeah, it's got a very nice pure interface, actually. They're good. Um, I've been using it, um, been moving from Lipson to them, and a really nice interface. Um, very slick, very polished, compared to Lipson's piece of shit. <laughs> um, 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 just, just as a breath of fresh air, actually. Well, you uh, know, um, Lipson is about as old as, as WordPress, uh, almost, and uh, it kind of shows. Well, they've got oh, a new. They're supposed to have I, a new I, interface I hear they're coming, coming out. out with a new interface. But I, want, I, I wonder what it. made them. I wonder what made them do that. Actually, Sally, I wonder what made them do that. Uh, um, uh, um, but like I say, if you're looking to get into podcasting, uh, a hard road. Me and Chris will tell you it's a walled in, but a hard road, isn't it, Chris? Uh, yeah. um, um, you really should look at their plans and it's amazing value as well um compared to lipson's prices it was quite surprising um i paid my own plan they uh, um and um it's excellent value so sandy have you got anything to recommend and please put it in slack your recommendations can you uh um, uh, yes, I, I, I have a recommendation for something new that my that my husband just told me about, and I've I've barely begun uh, trying. Uh, it, it's a web browser called Vivaldi, uh, mm. and it's fast, and it doesn't uh, suck up your memory while it's just idling. Um, and uh, also, uh, a thing that that my husband had not noticed uh, while checking it um, is it actually lets you post to Instagram from your computer which uh for people like me is good because i'd rather edit my photos on my computer than on my phone even if i took them on my phone because as i've mentioned before i'm old i have trouble seeing uh, uh, uh so i'm looking forward to trying this out uh more and it's also got uh you know added uh privacy and and ad protection uh, my husband also just discovered Brave, the uh, browser uh, built yeah. by jo Jonathan's uh, good buddy. 
there's a few of them out there. I'm just I've been with Firefox for ages, but I, I've got I, I use Firefox by default and uh, was told not to use it for StreamYard, uh, uh, so I don't. Um, oh, well, that's probably why I was having some technical problems because I was. Uh, um, so I better stop using it, but. Every time I have to back up the bookmarks because I rely on all my bookmarks. It, it's amazing. Then every time, and um, I don't have it on automatic update, and it tells me every time now I have to make sure I back up everything because it it totally destroys all the bookmarks every time. Uh, well, that every that that would be. A, I I keep all of my bookmarks in Raindrop. And so I can access them all from any browser. Oh, oh which one are you using? Rainmark, is it? Raindrop. Raindrop. Rain. Well, put that in. I O. Put that in. Is that free? Yeah, put that in. Is that free? Yes. I, there, oh, no. there is a paid Rain option, but I do not use it. Raindrop.io. Yeah. Huh. yeah, put that into Slack as well, can you? Oh, uh, um, Chris, have you got anything to recommend to the listeners of yours? I do. Last week, I made a piece of content. I've been trying to make more YouTube tutorial content. And I've, I noticed, made, I've noticed. I have made some content on how to build a site like Udemy with WordPress. And Udemy has $296,500,000 in funding. I built oh, well, I, get that, I, get that, I get that every week. Can you build yeah, me a, yeah. U, 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 a Udemy site for 500 I, joggers? <laughs> you know, well, yes, can you do it? Right, well, it's, I, it's up there with the people no, who want I you to build at Amazon.com. <laughs> it really has $296 million in funding? Yes, and I, and I got that on Crunchbase, so that's that's the legit deal. So what I wanted to prove, because I get this question all the time, is I can build that site in two hours with a handful of plugins, mostly free, Lifter, WooCommerce, and I chose this plugin called WC Vendors to create a more... Um, instructor commission sharing kind of interface. So it's a more advanced type of site. And it was my first time working with WC vendors, which is my plugin recommendation. They have a free version. I actually use the free version for what I needed to do. Um, but I'm sure some of their paid features would come in handy as well. And I was really impressed with this plugin. So that's WC vendors to create a marketplace with WooCommerce. And I just made that bigger into the education use case in my video but this, yeah this, check out wc vendors i yeah. think chris, chris Lim, i think chris lemon he's one of his me mega emails looked at a number there's about four or five plugins isn't there that can help there's assist Doka, you there's Doken and wc vendors are the two big ones Please do not approach me asking us to build it for you for five hundred dollars, though. Whoever you are, because uh, I'm not doing it. So, uh, um, Spencer, um, Gwynny, Spencer, have you got anything you want to recommend to the listeners of viewers? Uh, because I am continually waking up and thinking of Sally's desire to convince me to use the Gutenberg editor. I'm going to make a recommendation because in good in good spirit I want to try to love oh, Gutenberg. There is a I plugin just that my now life's works. too short to waste my time. I'm there, sorry. there is a plugin that now works with WP Fusion, it works with launch flows, it works with the Lifter LMS. But anybody who's building stuff using the stack that we recommended WP Launchify, it is called the block visibility plugin. It's a great it's plugin. In the directory. And what it does, so logical is it gives you the same kind of level of control that you have at the page with a meta box over a block so that you can use marketing automation or other logic like, is the person logged in? Does the person have a tag? Is it, I don't know if it's this level, but like, is are they from Chicago? Because the UTC or the UTM code or something else in the you know a referral says they're from. And it allows you to build a layout that is different for different people under different circumstances. So because I need to know this stuff, for the plugin and for the other things that we review. Um, I gave it a shot and it's terrific. So if you added this together with some of the other Gutenberg accessory tools and you avoid using Gutenberg, but instead you just use patterns and templates and visibility, it's not tolerable, but it's approaching less than sticking my hand in the garbage disposal level of pain. 
Um, someday soon, I hope it gets better. But this would be one that's free, definitely worthy of checking out. And it's got the seal of approval of WP Fusion because it works with WP Fusion. So if you use tags and so forth. Um, Sounds yeah. good to me. Right. All right, let's wrap it up. Before I wrap it up, I've got a couple of things I want to tell you, my beloved tribe. Uh, um, oh, you must have read my mind. Uh, um, uh, we've got a free webinar with Uncle Spencer here. Um, it's next Friday, the 9th of April at 10.30 Pacific Standard Time. It, we're gonna, it's going to be part of a series of webinars where we're from beginning to end, we're going to show you how to build a modern membership website using the best WordPress technology on the market in 2021. We're going to be showing you from beginning to end through this series of webinars. Spencer is an experienced educator and he spent quite a bit of time building this course out. Uh, um, we're going to be using Lifter LMS as well as part of the stack. That should make Chris really very happy. And we'll be showing you how to use WP Fusion launch flows and um, I think Fluent CRM to build a truly powerful membership learning management um, platform. I'm yeah. excited, and I'm sure Spencer is excited as well. Are you not? I am. I want to clarify a couple things too. First of all, um, the focus that I want to like stick my flag in the sand. It's April, but. Remember way back when I made a bet about whether WordPress would ever get around through Automatic's efforts of Jetpack to like call WordPress a stack and do what it is. And they have not. As we talked about today, or I alluded to, even if you go to wordpress.org, you would have very little clue that there is actually an extremely powerful platform living at your fingertips. If you go to ClickFunnels or Kartra, Russell Brunson or the late Andy Jenkins is there telling you, look, here's the features, here's the set. When you go to WordPress coming from the outside world, you have no clue that inside of this gigantic potluck dinner is a stack of the things you need. My goal was to say, what can I do to bring that forward? So I'm on the record. I'm saying WP Launchify is my effort to do what Matt Mullenweg and his team are not willing to do, which is to say, here's the stack of stuff. Here are all the plugins. We are going to objectively present them to people. And there's not always one choice. There, are, For example, Chris acknowledges this. There's Lifter. There's LearnDash. There's reasons why you use one versus the other. And for some people, some companies, there's a reason. We will be like many other companies, objectively displaying and reviewing them. And if somebody comes in and gives their personal criterion, giving the, the logic and the decision tree for why one is a better match for you, so that if you came to WordPress, or even if you're in WordPress, you don't have the shiny ball syndrome of why are there six choices for an LMS and what do I do with them all? Or why is there this page builder versus that? Or why is Gutenberg suck versus, you know? And instead, we want to show people it's a very logical thing, just like a platform. The webinar is the thing that I used to do regularly once a week at 1WDTV. I haven't done webinar like this in a long time. I just want to clarify. It wasn't hard for me to put together because I used the stack. What was hard was for us to finally arrive at the place of where can I in this space really have the most impact on people? And I think it is to do the thing that we're doing now, which is it's a free webinar for somebody who builds for a living or who needs to use WordPress for a living to see that using a step-by-step -step process. But, um, I wasn't. I wasn't indicating it was hard to build no, it. No, it, was no, hard, it, was, it, it was. It was just hard to build a course up to your normal high and vigorous standards. I'm That's trying to I mean. say. I'm trying to say, like, if we talk so, about. So, so what you're saying, Spencer, is is that the marketing uh, team really needs to recruit you? No, I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying what we're doing now is. Let's say I'm representing Lifter. Lifter and Chris have done an amazing job of building this, you know, well-known, respected product. It is the product to use for many people. However, it is not living in a vacuum anymore. And I think Chris would acknowledge this. There's less people who use Lifter as the only plugin in their stack as those who would use it along with other things, WooCommerce, WP Fusion, and so forth. So the confusion comes from if I spent every waking moment of Chris's day asking him questions. 
he still couldn't teach me everything I need to know about snapping it together with other stuff. That's the job of the platform. But unlike Russell Brunson, there is nobody in WordPress who is saying, hey, it's simple, A plus B plus C. Yeah, like, but, but, you know, it's a difficult area, isn't it? Curation, you know, having curators, you know, that's, you know, it's a, you know, Chris Lemmer built a whole career to some extent in being a recognized curator, a, and, uh, a voice that says you should look at this and this. There's, um, and there, there, there's, other, there's other voices like yourself that want to be recognized curators. But one of the strengths, but also one of its fundamental weaknesses of WordPress is, and it will always be there, is that you've got multiple solutions doing the same thing. And that causes confusion, but it's also a strength because, you know, um, you have choice. So it will always be well, a Well, it sounds like Spencer is doing something extremely valuable yeah. in terms of telling us which solution is best for what. Yeah. Exactly. Here's the here's the differentiator because I, I, I'm a business associate and friendly with the people you referenced who are well known in our industry, right? Chris Lemma and you know a Bob WP and Adam Presser. They are all experts and have huge audiences of people who respect their opinion. But there's one huge difference. If you ask your best friend, I I'm maybe you're lucky enough. I'm dating three different people and I want to know which one should I marry. Okay. The answer you want is this person or that Wipe person. Wipe it up there. <laughs> Part of the United States. It's not all three of them. The problem when you have people who are well-known, you know, respected teachers and educators, and this is objectively true. They don't hide it. They're all doing affiliate marketing where their affiliate relationships do get in to their recommendations. In other words, Chris does not tell you this is the right one for today for you specifically. He will be objectively saying, here's all the pluses, here's the minuses, read through what I say and make your choice. But that doesn't really get anybody any closer to a decision. What I'm well, trying I... to do is go right to the platform and tell it what you need and it will tell you which one. But not because there aren't other choices, well, but I... because I... here's your first... You know, I... Can I can I wrap up this podcast? So there we are. We got almost uh, the whole uh, webinar. Get, uh, um, so you, <laughs> you can. You can we're we're so like uh, early today. So I mean, yeah. we're only at eleven thirty. It's not like we have. Yeah. Nothing else. Let, let, let's try and wrap up this podcast. Um, you can tell Spencer's really powered up for our uh, webinar on the night. It should be entertaining. I'm excited. Um, one, about, I, hold on, I'm excited about one thing. We come on <laughs> week after week. And we all, I mean, Chris, <laughs> hold on. Chris is the most objectively diplomatic of the four of us. But nevertheless, even Chris would agree that we come on week after week now for years. And what do we keep repeating? That automatic is not doing anything in furtherance of clarifying to the ordinary user, whether they're an individual or business, what amazing magic is at their fingertips. Well, they do. No, no, you're on. They just, they just recommend Jetpack. Well, but okay, so then it's all the drama. But, well, but, yeah, see, jet, it's their whole stack. They, like, I mean, no, Jetpack, did you, did you know the whole six? Did you realize? Are you not on message, Spencer? Do you not realize that the whole success of WordPress has been based on Jetpack? I, th the point I'm making is that <laughs> we sit here and whine and bitch, and I'm the biggest whining or bitcher of all of how ridiculous it is because. It makes a marketplace for all of us, and we all benefit as being a provider of services or plugins. But let's say even those of us who write the plugins, it does us a disservice when people okay. who come in and are interested, let's say, in an LMS, do not understand how simple it could be to have everything else there as the supporting foundation upon yeah. which they can add. Can, we, um, go off can, to the you, um, you, can you put the great image behind you of the great leader? Let's get my brother. I don't, I don't have it with StreamYard. You don't have him. So... Uh, um, I've, can we end this now? Uh, before we get to the um, ending part, I also want to tell us that we, me and Spencer and Chris is a member and John Locke and my co-host on my first interview, Stephen, of a new WordPress, uh, a new Facebook WordPress mastermind, membership mastermind group. And if you want to join us and ask questions and be part of the tribe,
please join the group. You'd be most welcome. Spencer's told me he's going to be spending tons of time on the group page and he'll be answering we just like me every day something valuable there which includes a lot of the things we're talking about which is if you went <laughs> if you went <laughs> well you know what like, like it was so funny to me and i'm not being argumentative because you're partnering in this you seem to be willing to say people should go there but you're unwilling for us to talk about it for five minutes but yet it really does solve a lot of the problems that we're discussing here in our anecdotal conversation which is WordPress no. is amazing, but it's a really convoluted yeah. mess of stuff. If we can offer to people a way to go in and see what they need, what what I think we're doing is helping a greater number of people. This is not about selling this or that plugin or service. There's no selling. It is literally like somebody walking out in front of the Home Depot and greeting your car and saying, can you tell me a little bit about why you're here? Oh, I'll run in and get that stuff for you and hand you the list of what you need. And I don't understand why it's so funny. It's just like- No, it's just that you got all, you, you, you just, you're just I'm just picturing someone having an, a conversation with my car. You know, you're right. just very caffeinated and very passionate this morning and you've been going on about it for 10 minutes. So, and, I, and I, I've got a phone call the next 10 minutes I've got to take. So we're gonna end this podcast. Spence has been very passionate. We'll see you next week for another WP Tonic Round Table Show. See you soon, folks. Bye. Bye. K kill it, will you? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>